Hello, I'm Susan Cole. And I'm Matthew Hodson. And welcome to AIDS Map Chat, our live show bringing you news about HIV for people all around the globe. We've got a very special edition of AIDS Map Chat this week because we wanted to respond to some of the concerns which have been raised amongst people living with HIV about monkeypox, which has broken out in the UK, across Europe and in the US as well. So in addition to our previously scheduled list of incredible guests, we have Dr. Claire Dusnap, who is the president of the British Association for Sexual Health and HIV. But not only do we have Dr. Claire Dusnap, we also have Mark Lewis, who works for the UK government's all-party parliamentary group on HIV and AIDS. We have one of our new AIDS map writers, Edith McGack, who is a new addition to our reporting team, and she's recently been bringing us stories from the Interest HIV Conference, which was held in Kampala. And we have Anton Basenko, who is a Ukrainian community activist and advocate for people who use drugs. What wonderful guests. And because we have four guests this week, we are going to go straight into it. Less of the chit chat from Matthew. No gossip, no gossip this week. Let's get Claire on. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, Claire. Hi. I am I am up for gossip, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, so st stay on after the broadcast and we'll, we'll, we'll do all of that. Um, Claire, I, I, so I've got to say, I, I've got friends. I mean, I've got friends who've literally just come back from Gran Canaria and were Gran Canaria Pride, and they're kind of calling me up and saying, well, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. There's all these cases. So what are the symptoms of monkeypox, which they should be looking out for, and if they get those symptoms, what should they be doing about it? So the classical symptoms are an unusual particular rash. Traditionally, people are supposed to have um, what we call a prodrome, so symptoms of a virus infection beforehand. But in the presentation of the cases that we've seen, particularly cluster in London, that hasn't been the case. So if you don't get a fever or lymph nodes or uh, feeling generally unwell, then that doesn't exclude you from having monkeypox. The classical rash is a bumpy rash, which basically looks like bumps with liquid, clear liquid in. And that can be anywhere, traditionally on the face first and then later on other parts of the body, including the genitals. Right. And if they if they if you someone's got that, that rash, what, what do they do then? So the first thing they should do is go to their sex, ring their sexual health clinic. And most sexual health clinics now have um, a pathway which will allow people to get in very quickly. So we can assess you and see if you do indeed have monkeypox or some other infection. Obviously, we want people to call us because there's a possibility they could have another STI like herpes or syphilis. And we'd need to see them fairly quickly to see, sort that out. If it's out of hours, then you ring NHS 11. Um, and if it's if you want to ring your GP and you don't want to go to the sexual health service, you can also ring your GP. Um, and, and Claire, are people living with HIV who contract monkeypox at any greater risk of serious illness? So the understanding that we have at the moment is that if you have a normal immune system, so your CD4 count is above 200 and you contract um, monkeypox whilst living with HIV, you are not at any particular great risk of becoming more significantly unwell. Um, but we do want people to obviously inform their regular doctors, um, so in particular the people that look after their HIV care um, on a regular basis if they think they have symptoms of monkeypox. Um, so it'd be more the people that we would worry about is people who have low CD4 counts. Right. And is, is there a connection? I mean, you, you talked about low CD4 counts, but what about viral suppression? I mean, does that make a difference, do you think, in terms of risk of severe illness? So there's very little in the way of understanding about this because there's very little data. Um, so all the cases that have been looked at where people living with HIV have acquired monkeypox have been people who haven't been on treatment and they haven't had access to treatment. So it's hard to be certain. The take that I think we're taking and, and Beaver seem to be taking the same approach. Um, sorry, the British HIV Association seem to be taking the same approach. Um, and that is that if you've got an undetectable viral load and your immune system is restored um, to some degree, then you're less likely to become ill with it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's always really important to consider viral suppression as well as CD4 count, just because a lot of us aren't having our CD4 counts measured at the moment. No, um, exactly. Yeah. So, so now we, we, we know that they're starting to roll out the smallpox vaccine vaccination for healthcare providers. 
Um, but there have been concerns around the smallpox vaccination in the past that actually you know, there is a you know, small risk attached to it, and particularly for people with compromised immunity. Do we know whether, I mean, if you were living with HIV and you were offered the smallpox, smallpox vaccine, should you take it? Yes, I would say you should take it. So um, as a general rule, um, again, if you are on treatment, your viral load suppressed and your CD4 count is good, um, then you're going to be perfectly fine with the current smallpox vaccine. That's what we're recommending. Um, so we definitely think if you have any concerns about that and you're offered it, that you should definitely contact your regular doctor. That's the advice that the virologists are giving us at the moment. And personally, that's the advice I'll be giving to patients I see in clinic. And uh, right. what about pregnant women living with HIV? Are they at any greater risk if they um, contract um, monkeypox? Yes, so we're postulating, although again, we don't have a great deal of numbers, that you potentially could be at greater risk. And the approach to you um, having vaccine may well be different. As far as I'm aware, there haven't been guidelines drawn up about that yet. So if you're pregnant, you're living with HIV, and you think you might be at risk of monkeypox virus, either because you've been with somebody who had it, or you've got a close household contact with it, then you should definitely speak to your clinic about whether that's um, whether that's going to be useful for you. At the moment, my understanding is that we don't really know. I would imagine that we'll start collecting some data about pregnant women, and then we'll then we'll be able to, as we go, make some decisions. All right. And the fi final question, I mean, as we've seen with COVID, I mean, the, one of the challenges of dealing with new emerging infections in, in the modern era is the level of misinformation. So what are the most reliable sources of information that people can go to if they want to have more information about monkeypox? Well, well, I would say this, but it's probably currently the British Association of Sexual Health and HIV website because we're updating on a daily basis and the British HIV Association website um, because we're trying to make sure what's most important is that the information that gets out isn't stigmatising people um, and isn't making people reluctant to access care or they don't identify as potentially being at risk and therefore they don't access care. So we're putting out as much broad information as we can so that if people aren't sure whether it's about them or not those are the places to go we've got a specific monkeypox section on our website and people can access that even if they're not healthcare professionals that's brilliant i mean i think it's, it's such an important point to make it's something which i've often talked about with with hiv is that you know these it's a virus it's a virus it, it doesn't it doesn't choose it doesn't judge it doesn't have any kind of morality to it it's you know it, it doesn't care if you've been bad or good it's not father christmas so, you know, it's really important that we recognise that what we're looking at is something that isn't about judgment. And we've got to really be careful in the reporting of it, particularly as in this case, it's been gay and bisexual men who've been most affected. Yeah, we absolutely Claire, thank have you so to... much for coming on. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Claire. Wonderful. Wonderful. I mean, I have to say, I've seen a, quite a few gay gay and bisexual men kind of feeling quite triggered by the early reporting, not just because some of it has been a bit homophobic, but also because when it says there's a new virus and it's affecting gay and bisexual men, you know, obviously people recognise those headlines from, you know, back in the early 80s. But we have to remember monkeypox, it's the mortality rate is much lower. Most people will clear it naturally. It's quite a mild infection, certainly compared to untreated HIV. So you know, it, it is a very different situation. Absolutely. We're going to have and, to. Um, and, and I say people that are feeling that way as well, just in terms of people of colour and, and seeing all the images are of people of colour with monkeypox. So I think the media just needs to be conscious of that as well. Yeah, yeah. fight the disease, don't fight people who, who may have a greater risk of acquiring infection. We are now going to go to our, <laughs> our next guest is in the most fabulous room imaginable. Um, <laughs> look at that. It's not even just a Zoom backdrop. That's actually where he is. Where are you, Mark? I'm in the Royal Gallery in the House of Lords. Okay, so wow. everyone else Fantastic. is now paling into insignificance in comparison. So you coordinate the all party parliamentary group on HIV and AIDS. So. Tell us about that. What, what are the current working priorities for that group? So at the moment, uh, we have completing a report on the quality of life of people living with HIV, not only in the UK, but uh, overseas. But we last year that 
uh, we published three reports. Uh, one on uh, nothing about us without us that addressed the issue of HIV for people of colour and migrants, uh, the impact of the UK government aid cuts uh, towards HIV and AIDS, and also testing, uh, what needed to be done uh, in testing in the UK. But previously to that, we were founded in 1986. So we've been around a long, long time. And one of the co-founders of the group is still a, a vice chair of the group, and that's Baroness Masham of Ilton and uh, she's a wealth of knowledge and we are there as a cross-party group to actually keep ensuring that HIV is still in the minds of the government uh, when it comes to public health at home and abroad. Wonderful and, and Mark so you work for a cross-party group representing all of the UK do you feel that HIV prevention and support serve all of the UK equally? Um, Yes, um, and however, there does need to be more. Um, and I think I agree with some, and, and the group agree with a lot of the HIV sector that um, the opt-out testing should be able to go to the other high prevalence areas within the UK, uh, places like Blackpool, uh, Leicester, the West Midlands, and places like that. Um, and coming from Wales, um, and coming from rural Wales, um, there needs to be more to educate, uh, especially populations from there on, on PrEP. Uh, a lot of people don't know about PrEP, uh, especially in rural areas, and that's a, pa a personal passion of mine, is to ensure that rural areas aren't forgotten, as well as the, uh, the, the other communities that sometimes forgot in the big cities. Absolutely. Um, um, what, you know, th this is more than just a, a job for you, because you personally are also living with HIV, and you recently chose to kind of be very open about that. What, 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 what inspired you to do that? Uh, well, I've been living with HIV now coming up for four years, um, and I thought it was a bit hypocritical of me uh, when trying to advocate for change regarding stigma and the messaging that's going out. And I wasn't living publicly and couldn't say my story, even though everyone knew my story because I was saying it through the third person. But the main thing was the internalized stigma uh, on how my parents were going to take it and also other community, uh, other members of the family and other members back in Wales. Um, so if once I told my parents, and I told my parents that five minutes after the conversation, we just went back to normal and carried on no, uh, talking normal, you know? Um, yeah. And that's what encouraged me is to, if I can do it. And then since then, I've had two people coming to me from West Wales, ask, saying how brave I was coming out living with HIV. And it's given them the courage to go and tell their own parents and their friends as well. I think it's so important because when we do tell our stories, we are dismantling stigma. Um, and, uh, and, and because stigma is still creating so many barriers to HIV testing and therefore to HIV treatment, you know, if we can, and, you know, and I always, you know, have to stress this because I do appreciate this for some people, it may not even be safe to talk about living with HIV. But, you know, I know that for, for, for me, it was the same thing as once I told my parents, it's like, it's fine now, I can talk about it. And then when I did talk about it, I realized how much my internalized stigma had been holding me back and it was just so incredibly liberating to actually be very open about living with HIV. And, and that's, uh, that's what I felt, but also that's what we're trying to do in Parliament as well, is actually to normalize it and actually put in a um, human face to it as well, because a lot of people in Parliament will not come across someone living with HIV. And I've got to say, the APBJ back in 2012 actually launched a, a paper calling Raising the Profile of HIV and AIDS in your parliament. Um, and that was back in 2012. And that actually helped other uh, parliaments around the, uh, the world to do it as well. And that's what we need is more normal voices uh, of people living with HIV to get out there and say in their stories. And that's how we can change the perception of HIV and AIDS and also uh, to reform the um, services as well that are available for us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. It's been really great to have you on the show. Thank you, Mark. We're really having to whiz through everything. We've got so many guests. <laughs> so our, our next guest is is a new writer for AIDS Map, um, and it, it, it's Edith McGack. Uh, she is in Kenya, um, and she has recently been reporting from the Interest 2022 conference, uh, which was held in Kampala. Hi, Edith. Um, Edith, uh, Botswana has made great progress 
in, in terms of uh, halting vertical transmission. What do you think needs to happen in other sub-Saharan African countries for them to catch up? Thank you, Susan and Matthew, for having me. So first of all, Botswana <laughs> is a great example to other African countries and their success story, which other African countries need to replicate, is screening. So Botswana is doing a lot of testing. You know, they're, they're testing women when they register for antenatal care. They're retesting, you know, HIV negative women uh, on multiple occasions. Every three months during pregnancy, they're uh, testing at labor. They're even testing at delivery if there hasn't been a recent test. So other African countries need to increase screening, especially since even in my community, a lot of women give birth via traditional attendance. So you see, uh, there's that gap. So a lot of other African countries need to ensure that women give birth in hospitals and they're tested. And I read a report which you you, you, you filed the other day, um, and it was, it was talking about the very high burden of HIV within key populations. So that's men who have sex with men, hello, um, uh, trans people, sex workers, injecting drug users. How how are services responding to these populations in sub-Saharan Africa? Oh. That's a great question, Matthew. So uh, first of all, uh, key populations are being left behind because of the criminalization of uh, key pop most key populations. Um, so for example, I mean, there's the example of Ghana. Ghana has done a lot against the um, you know, LGBTQ community. So there's no mapping. First of all, there's no mapping. There's no size estimation. So a lot of countries do not even have data on key populations. So that really, uh, you know, stops services, especially in health facilities. And, and, and I mean, it, this, last week it was International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and, and Transphobia. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the key things, isn't it? Is that actually when we experience stigma, whether that's as gay or bisexual men or as lesbians or as trans people or as injecting drug users or as sex workers, that creates the barriers to to testing and to treatment and support what, what what's people's experience of those kind of phobias i mean the, do you, sorry it's touching like a crazy thing i do apologize but um how, how does that impact people's ability to access services so there are a lot of great examples that were shared uh, by key populations and how they're experiencing stigma, especially in health facilities. So for example, in Kenya, there are you know a special days and special times for people living with HIV and key populations to collect medicine. So it's Tuesday afternoon. So everybody knows if you're going to the hospital on Tuesday afternoon, you're going to collect um, you know uh, antiretrovirals. So even other people do not want to go to the hospital on Tuesday afternoon because you know nobody wants to go on Tuesday afternoon. So there are those uh, you know distinguishing and labeling differences. There's also an uh, association of uh, you know uh, negative attributes to key populations. So uh, health uh, health providers would say people who use drugs have bad morals. There's discrimination in health facilities uh, for key populations. So there was an example that was shared about uh, someone who died in the hospital because the aunt uh, was a health worker and she told other uh, colleagues not to treat this uh, gay man because he was having sex with men. So the nurses and the doctors abandoned this person and they died in the hospital. So there was a lot of stigma and discriminatory practices that are you know, taking place in health facilities. That's awful. And and how has COVID impacted on services? So uh, again, good question. So while everyone was thinking and expecting that COVID was going to have such negative uh, results for people living with HIV, but uh, sorry, Uganda proved uh, to be a striking, uh, wonderful. Uh, at the other conference, we had Dr. Jonathan Izudi who presented results from uh, Uganda. And he shared that in Uganda, uh, you know, uh, suppression rates, viral uh, load testing went up, suppression rates went up, mortality reduced during COVID. And that is because of all the great interventions and the uh, differentiated distribution services that were implemented during the pandemic. Yeah. One final question, just because I, I know you're really passionate about this. 
Um, PrEP, oral PrEP for, 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 for women. Um, what are the barriers that remain for access to PrEP uh, for, for young women? So before I share, I, I, I just must say that I come from a community, I come from a fishing community and HIV prevalence in my community is very huge because of this a phenomenon called Jaboya. So Jaboya, the women in my community, uh, we trade sex for fish. So because there's very little fish and the fishermen are very uh, particular about who they give fish, so the women would trade sex for fish. And while the women in my community are very passionate about family uh, planning services, so they go and get family planning services, PrEP has never been uh, you know, a key factor. So having oral PrEP integrated into family uh, planning services is a great tool for HIV prevention. But unfortunately, in this study that was presented at Interest Conference, uh, uh, oral PrEP integration had really, really poor results. And this is because there was a lot of bias that was uh, presented by the health workers. For example, if a young woman who was married went in and said, oh, I want PrEP, they were like, oh, but you're married. And then she'd say, oh, you're, my husband is living in a faraway town or a faraway country, or my husband is far away. They would say, oh, no, you're married. You don't need, you don't need PrEP. So there was a lot of challenges. Again, the family planning providers did not want to integrate PrEP because they felt that was a service that is supposed to be offered by HIV testing uh, providers and not family planning providers. And that's the challenge because these services are not integrated together. So in Kenya, you will have a HIV clinic offering PrEP and family planning providers do not offer PrEP. So they feel that if family planning providers will offer PrEP, they're doing somebody else's work. So they were like, no, this is too much work for us. So it's really the uptick we fail. That's devastating. But I mean, of course, when we, when we shine a spotlight on it, that's helping, I hope, to get those services up and running to you know, increase awareness and um, either Thank you so much. Your reports from Interest 2022 have been incredible. Uh, they're all on the AIDS map site, so people do please go and read them. Edith, thank you very much for joining us. Thank Thanks, you. Edith. Thank you. Wow. That's... Sure, let's crack on. Let's crack on. on well, our fi <laughs> final guest. Our final guest is Anton Pasenko. Uh, he is a Ukrainian community activist and advocate for people who inject drugs. He is uh, currently in Brussels, I believe. Is that right? Working yep, for yep. the European AIDS Treatment Group. Absolutely. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, Matthew. Hi. Hi it's um, great to have you Slava on the show. Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraini. Uh, um, I'm going to get pronounce it wrong and then that'll be awful. <laughs> now, so, I mean, Ukraine is... is, is obviously, it, it's very much in the news at the moment. Um, and we we do want to talk about that, but I also kind of wanted to talk about HIV within Ukraine and within people from Ukraine. Uh, so it's actually got very high prevalence in Ukraine um, and among populations from Ukraine. Um, and it's am I right in saying it's it's mainly driven by drug use? Is, is that correct? So yeah. So, According so what, their... what steps could governments take to reduce the harms from drugs? Uh, actually, yes, according to official data, uh, that's true. But since, uh, I mean, the, like like the, the drug use is, is, is still one of the main causes. But uh, at the same time, since 2008, the, the, the main uh, uh, way of uh, inf in, 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 in infection turned from uh, in, uh, bloodborne to... Um, sexual okay. but what we see from um ibbs researches for instance uh, I, I integrated by a behavioral study research every two years that it's still the sexual linkage is still uh goes from people who use drugs and their sexual partners so that's and 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 yes people who inject drugs are the largest um, key populations in Ukraine because we have concentrated epidemic and there are uh, 350,000 of people who inject drugs as an estimate number um, in Ukraine. But we, Ukraine, did a great job uh, and though we are formally on the second uh, second place after Russia in, in terms of the epidemic burden, but if you compare the, 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 the data and the, and the progress, the dynamic between two countries, uh, our epidemic and especially in 
among people who use drugs, it's it's uh, heavily it, it's decreased and stabilized. So uh, okay. since 2002, when Global Fund funding uh, entered the country and uh, we started to implement harm reduction uh, programs, which since 2017 uh, uh, turned to, to to the state budget funding, not only needle and syringe programs, but also opioid substitution therapy programs with methadone and buprenorphine. Um, so since 2002, uh, the prevalence of HIV uh, uh, among people who inject drugs was reduced from 41% to 21%. And among young uh, users, so-called young uh, users, it's a people who use drugs up to three years, not by age, but, but using because it's the most risk in that time, we reduce 10 times the prevalence. And our incidence stays, uh, stays on the very low and stable uh, level. Yeah, when, when in Russia, it's, it's, it's heavily increasing. So that's why we did a lot. But since 24th of February, when the war uh, has been started, uh, we are really uh, under the risk of, of losing all these uh, achievements. And, and Anton, um, how are host countries ensuring refugees from Ukraine have access not just to HIV treatments, but also to appropriate drug treatments? Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, we were really surprised to, to, to realize that access to um, a, a HIV treatment a, is much more easier and less problematic than access to opioid uh, substitution therapy for uh, Ukrainian refugees. Of course, the difference is that it, it, it's a uh, so-called controlled substances, uh, but there are a number of different issues which is re uh, related not only to, to this kind of treatment, but uh, to, to the... Uh, 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 I mean, the, the language barrier, uh, a difference in, in healthcare systems, difference in medications, even uh, we use the pills, uh, methadone and buprenorphine in pills, uh, mostly EU countries and UK use liquid methadone, for instance. So it's a number of, uh, yeah, we, uh, in Ukraine, 70% of substitution therapy patients, they have take-home dosages. They, they are not obliged, uh, they are stable patients, they are not obliged to come every day to the clinic, right? Um, in, in in some of the EU countries, you are still have to to to, to go daily, and then so yes, it's a number of issues. But with the support of uh, uh, many partners, local NGOs in EU countries, we 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 really managing all these issues together and with other stakeholders, of course. Um, Anton, obviously, the eyes of the world are on the people of Ukraine, and uh, what, what 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 message would you like to send? to the world now about the situation in Ukraine? Um, first of all, using this opportunity, I would like to say special thanks to, to people in uh, UK and uh, 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 especially to your um, amazing Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson. He, he visited the city, uh, uh, native city of my mother-in-law, which was uh, the months under occupancy of Russian troops. Uh, my mother-in-law, she's uh, luckily alive. Yes, and we really... Uh, feel this uh, support uh, from not only from UK, but from, from, from all of the world on different levels. As a common people, as a citizens, of course, we feel this uh, support on the political level, in, even in on Eurovision, right? Recent Eurovision. Uh, as as, <laughs> as a, as a um, c communities, we, uh, people living with HIV or people who use drugs, we really feel this uh, support. Uh, um, and by the way, UK is the largest, second largest donor of the Global Fund, which played really critical role in the support of uh, evacuation of uh, people from key populations from uh, now from the regions which are under the shelling and bombing. So it's it's really linked and in in this multi-stage, multi stakeholder Holders, let's say support and we really feel it uh, on the daily basis and it's 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 really touching my heart and i think touching hearts of ukrainians but the last point i would like to say it's not just a war of of uh, weapons it's uh, it's um, it, it's really the war of different paradigm of thinking of the old-fashioned war uh, old-fashioned world let's say even me 
medieval world where is no, I mean, the, 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 the Russian political repressive system where is no place to human rights, where is no even uh, place to, to, to speak about substitution therapy because it's, a, it's, it's considered as a propaganda, where there's no place to uh, uh, harm reduction. And Ukraine, which, uh, you, and Ukrainians, which identified and uh, their own, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, the paradigm, and they want to move forward to, the, to, to progressive uh, things and the, where the human rights is not the empty sound and where they keep populations. Though, though we are not... An, perfect but still this the life-saving services and treatment are available and 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 uh, i want to people to realize that it's not just uh, uh, this support is needed not just because of the weapons you know but uh, but because of the public health and the lives of people who are under the uh, risks huge risks now that's an incredibly powerful message thank you so much anton for coming on the show and for sharing that with us Thank you, Anton, and thank you about highlighting about the, the Global Fund, crucially important, and I really hope um, the UK will continue to fund the Global Fund to the extent that they have been and fulfil their commitments. So thank you ever so much. Thanks. You're always welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's oh, it. My we, pow we powered through it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, thank you so much to all of our tremendous guests I and mean, so much incredibly important information there yeah um do tell your friends about it because it will be available to view on uh, aids maps facebook and twitter page after this live broadcast as well as on our youtube channel and in, on our website aids map uh so thank you to mark edith uh so mark edith anton and claire uh, to our sponsors, Theratech and Wants of Paratus, and to all the wonderful crew at Disruptive. We will be back in two weeks' time, and our guests will include the LGBT health advisor to the government, Dr. Mike Brady. So, see you then. Thank you all so much for joining us. See you soon. Bye. Bye. -bye.